be that we're not really looking anymore. Yeah. And a lot of what I did, especially with the more romantic narrative work, mm -hmm. is tried to get back to presenting you something that's a photograph that really is a painting in all practical right. purposes, other than the human figures in those works. Right. Every single thing I've digitally painted. Right. And in fact, when you were talking about the ships on the horizon, I owe a huge part of that to finally seeing a large group of turners right. uh, when I was over in Europe one time and noticing that magic quality that had always been described to me of these ships that he'd paint or these waves that he'd paint, mm -hmm. and you'd get up close and it was a wisp of paint. Oh, I mean, it there. totally dissolved. Right. And his ability to know what was just enough gave me the... Um, courage to come back and try that because when i first started painting these digital mm -hmm. landscapes i was really putting a lot of detail in them right um but my fascination with the narrow depth of field and the pictorialist aesthetic um made me realize that what i was doing in these digital paintings to make them appear like photographs as i was getting rid of a lot a lot mm -hmm. of the detail anyway right so where in the beginning i was drawing these impossibly intricate ships and then blurring them, and 80% of what I was drawing went away. Right. I learned much more simply to make a few lines, and once you blurred it, it was a ship. Sure. You know, and sometimes a better-looking ship yeah, than what I was able to do if I had done it, you know, very technically correct. Sure. You know, I, I feel like, um, you know, going back to, to what you mentioned about uh, Hockney and the optics and uh, Vermeer and people n not wanting to accept you know, that, that truth. And, you know, it's interesting, um, the, the premium that, that people will place on, uh, on craft, right? Yes. And, and how, how that premium, um, uh, that premium kind of, uh, kind of evolve, it kind of flows, right? Like people are object to, that notion of Vermeer utilizing the optics because it lessens the amount of craftsmanship that would have been in his hand. Right. They assume, right. They assume, but you know, you're a teacher and I'm a teacher and, um, you will, you can allow two students to trace something. You can allow the two students. Let, let's say you put a, a photograph up on a, this is, shows my age. I was going to say an overhead projector. Right. Well, we have digital projectors now, but but put that up and trace it. You're not going to get a good picture out of that. No. You're going to get a couple of things in the right places. But when you see what those two students do to that resulting image, mm -hmm. defines whether they understand the act of mark making and and the elements and principles and, sure. and everything else. So thinking, you know, when people think that, oh, Vermeer traced, well, yes, and so did Caravaggio. And so did almost every artist that people think is worth their salt. Yes, right. there was some of that. And it was a, it was a trade secret, mm -hmm. often because, you know, it was a business. Right. And if you had a way of doing something, you know, way back to the Flemish artists, sure. when they found out that a concave mirror could project... Um, an image on the canvas. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not going to share that, right? Because that's their, you know, their ability to kind of keep the edge in their their business making. But it is obvious all through all throughout art history, uh, sure. from you know, late medieval period on. Sure, and you know, I mean, even uh, when we think about photog photography in contemporary senses, you know, I, I feel like sometimes people discount photography because they maybe in their mind feel like there is not as much uh, you know hands-on craftsmanship but in, in, again that's probably just naivete not understanding exactly how much burning and things are going on in images you know like people just kind of take Ansel Adams uh, photogra photographs as being oh well you know look what he went out and documented mm -hmm. versus you know how enormously different the resulting images are from the negatives and how much manipulation he did in the dark room people don't get that right yeah and so uh so you so you're doing uh a ton of heavy lifting with with these images so you yeah they they're 
and again, you know, even though I'm presenting it to you as a photograph, it's not. Right. It, it's, it's not. It, 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 it's, you know, I, I feel like we, you know, we can't put you in that uh, that photographer box. I feel like you're really a, a, I don't know, I think we just need to call you an artist. Uh, I, you know, I think we could be inclined to call you a digital artist, but that's, you know, that is just... Uh, that in a number of years is going to be arcane anyway because er, it will. You know, it's like people talking about the internet. You know, in ten well, years, people aren't even going to talk about the internet. It's also the fact that much the same way as if you say you're a photographer, people are like, oh, you just took that picture. Right. Uh, when you tell somebody that you're a digital artist, they're like, oh, right. you know, they think that so much of it's done by the computer. Uh, none of it's done by the computer. It's done by the artist. Right. And a lot of that narrative work, you know, you're approaching seventy or eighty layers. Right. Uh, of very tiny digital marks that, much like the stroke of a paintbrush, mm-hmm. assemble themselves into a larger entity sure. and a believable entity. So the the work, uh, like the um, uh, the Trinity uh, Trinity River work, the the work uh, you know with uh, whether it be the, the icebergs or the the tall ships or some of these, are you are you compiling? multiple photographs or is there a lot of digital mark making or is it both the icebergs there's no photographic material in that at all wow uh, even the waves no the waves are drawn wow. the waves are now the cool thing about the waves though is it, it, and it is the wonderful thing about working digitally as opposed to a paintbrush mm-hmm. is you could work on a sort of a couple three or four prototype wave like things and then start tiling them and stretching them and so that's how a lot of those happen i mean and if you examine those closely you'll see some similarities and i kind of kept thinking oh people are going to see this too much as you know that i'm tiling this and stuff like that but then i went back and looked at photographs of the ocean right and it looks the same i mean it looked you, you could see it as oh well all these waves are the same you know uh, again, it's going back and looking at painters as influences more than photographers. Uh, you mentioned the Trinity portfolio. The Trinity portfolio is a total anomaly for me because that is, um, and I don't say this ironically, you could take it this way. It's my first straight body of work. Um, I went down and actually documented the Great Trinity Forest in photographs, and those photographs are unmanipulated. Okay. Um, what I like is how much they tend to look like my manufactured it, it, it fits work. your body of work. But, right. and, but conceptually, I love that because right. then uh, once again, it calls into question, you know, well, are these fake? Well, no, these are real pictures of the Trinity right. Forest, and that's 15 minutes south of downtown right. Dallas. Well, then well, are these ships, you know, you know, where did you take the pictures of the ships? They're all real art. Yeah, they are. Right. Yeah. right. But so, then people say, well, where did you take the pictures of the ships? I'm like, I didn't take pictures of the ships. There are no pictures, you know, or no photographs. Right. They're drawn. It gets confusing. But the Trinity, yeah. the, the Trinity work really is something different than anything I've ever done. And it was so enormously refreshing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I needed it. Right. Uh, it felt nice to be able to do that. Um and it certainly gave me a boost mentally um, when I was struggling with some other bodies of work. Sure. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there, I, 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 I love your aesthetic. And I love how you, uh, you're not scared to, um, you know, underexpose an, an image. I mean, it, it, there, it, it communicates a quality that's, you know, uh, rather ominous and mysterious. Uh, at least that uh, you know. Yeah, I think in our modern aesthetic, I mean, we we don't see uh, we don't see this aesthetic much in our contemporary media. No, we don't. And you know, it's uh, I I really like pushing that. I like I like work. Like I said earlier, I like work that doesn't fit. Right. Um. I like anachronistic looking things. I like things that look like they're from way in the future or way in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never been one of those artists that hustled to Miami every year and looked at what everybody else was mm-hmm. doing and then came back to my studio and made even more anemic versions of what they saw. Right. Uh, I know a number of artists that do that. I, it's very sad to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, 
it'll sell, mm -hmm. um, but it'll also be put a, back up for sale in a very short period of time. Right. Um, I love work that is so strange and odd and out of place that you keep coming back to it. I think every artist that has ever been an influence to me has been that way. Sure. Has, has had that idiosyncratic strangeness that even they didn't fit in the time period that well. Uh, kind of forging their own path. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we, we've talked a lot about the, the stuff that's, um, uh, uh, I'm just going to say dark for, uh, lack of a better word. There, there's this other body of work, um, that are, uh, you know, you're probably better at, you know, choosing the words that describe your work, uh, than I would, but, you know, I would call it something along the lines of, you know, digital cloudscapes. That's fine. Right. That's fine. And so, you know, I could, I could just, I could put words in everybody's mouth to describe what I was doing. And it doesn't mean anything. Right. Ultimately, once you create a work of art and release it into the world, it has to speak for itself. Right. And so I'm glad to accept what anybody wants to say. Sure. They are. So these uh, these are full of color, you know, whereas the other ones are uh, monochromatic in, in war one tone or another. The, your, the, your, the body of work that we have been talking about, you know, uh, very, uh, very cool monochromatic, uh, tones, uh, versus this other body of work is, uh, really pushing, um, the bounds of color theory. But I, you know, my impression is that it's rooted in, um, you know, documented color as you found it in nature. Absolutely. That's what, that's what those started as, um, the original clouds were when I was coming straight off of that uh, early minimal work that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, when I would finally felt comfortable enough to bring subject matter back into the work, clouds were a perfect subject mm -hmm. because like the work I was creating, uh, viewers bring to clouds whatever they want to bring to them. They bring their own set of history and circumstances. And so right. we look at a cloud and you see a bunny and I see Abraham Lincoln. You know, we, we, we see what we want to see in it. And um, so when I started doing the clouds, technically I started wondering because I was always looking at the sky and I was taking pictures of the sky and the colors were just so incredibly fake, mm -hmm. even though it's what I was looking at. Right. Um, and I started thinking about, could I take these images and digitally dissect them mm -hmm. and add nothing to them and take nothing away, but reassemble those pieces in a radically different way right. to emphasize the fakeness or the seemingly seeming fakeness of what you were looking at. Um, and that's what those early clouds were. In fact, a lot of them were based on a trip that I went made to Lubbock uh, to deliver some artwork. Okay. And, um, I kept stopping and taking pictures and I got home with these amazing skyscapes. Right. And started pulling them apart, pulling them apart into just colors and mm -hmm. shapes and then playing around with them. And in those early clouds, very tiny portions of that photograph would end up being major portions of the final piece right. and major portions of the photograph would end up being very minor portions of the piece. So I could play with size and scale, but I sure. never added or took away. Very interesting. You know, uh, you know, I, I'm a native of Texas and I, I am totally a sucker for, uh, for skyscapes. And I, you know, I even did a body of work where it was, um, where I was doing paintings just of clouds. I mean, I, I have this feeling that, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, it's where some, uh, some parts of the U S have these, you know, m you know, mountainscapes, you know, in, the, you know, the spring and summer, we have these thunderheads that pop up that are, yeah. you know, as majestic or more majestic. And, you know, I can totally see the, the inspiration there. Uh, but I, I think it's really interesting, you know, picking it apart and putting it back together and, you know, part of that is, you know, I feel like you're you're maintaining 
you're maintaining the the notion of a cloud, but the individual pieces 